Perceive, process, perform. Do you need inspiration for your practice? Or do you simply need to practice inspiration? With this series, we aim to do both. Give us 15 minutes and we'll give you practice inspiration. Hi, I'm Tom Viola. I am a uh, clinical consultant pharmacist in private practice in the state of New Jersey. And I have the uh, unique advantage of uh, serving as a registered pharmacist in uh, five states, as well as serving as an instructor of dental pharmacology uh, over the past 20 years. So I have this uh, perspective on pharmacology that I think I don't share with many, and that is that uh, pharmacology has always been this enigma, this mystery. And like all good enigmas or great secrets, uh, the way to get to the bottom of it is to wait until uh, the good information has become declassified. So I call them, uh, my courses Pharmacology Declassified because pharmacology, in my opinion, is probably your most valuable instrument in treating today's medically complex patients. Uh, my job as a clinical pharmacist and as an educator, writer, speaker is to take pharmacology and boil it down into bite-sized, palatable pieces that you can use every day in practice that makes pharmacology finally practical and pertinent. And so what I've gathered today for this uh, practice inspiration is a collection of some of the tips that I have shared with my audiences and they have shared with me over the course of time. And this is just a brief snippet into the wealth of information there is about how pharmacology can be valuable to you and your practice every day. Uh, so let's get into, for example, medications used in dentistry. Uh, and we'll start off with local anesthetics. Now, local anesthetics are by far one of our most valuable resources in dentistry for the control of pain. Uh, but in each case, I'm going to show you how we, there are considerations and implications. We're talking about this medically complex patient, and along with those complex patients come those considerations. So for example, we're using local anesthesia on a patient with liver disease. So this is a patient with either chronic liver disease, chronic liver dysfunction, hepatic insufficiency, hepatitis, cirrhosis. So what type of implication does that have on us in dentistry in using local anesthetic agents? Well, we know that the amide local anesthetic agents are metabolized primarily in the liver. So as a result, using uh, anesthetics, amide anesthetics, requires good liver function. Well, in this case, you've got a patient without this good liver function that we so desire. So what type of implications and what type of treatment planning can we do to get around this? And of course, septicane, articane, is the preferred agent in this situation because septicane, unlike the other amides, is metabolized primarily in the plasma instead of the liver. So it's metabolized outside the liver and therefore it's advantageous in this situation. Well, along those same lines, what about those patients who have allergies or sensitivities to paraminobenzoic acid or true ester sensitivity, where they've known in the past that they've been sensitive to ester anesthetics that have been injected? So we've got a patient with a documented allergy to PABA or ester anesthetics. Now, I know you've heard that before, PABA. Where have you heard that before? Well, sunscreen. So one of the things I've recommended to my audiences over time is when we're starting to get into the use of esters in the future, we're going to need to add that question to our medical questionnaire. Do you have an allergy to PABA-based sunscreens? Now, if you're watching this, you're saying, well, why would I be concerned with ester anesthetics? We don't use those anymore. But as a matter of fact, the latest uh, introduction into the market of local anesthesia has been the product Covenase. If you know about Covenase, you know that its active ingredients are tetracaine, and oxymetazoline, also known as Afrin, nasal spray. Well, tetracaine is an ester. Now, you might say, well, I've been using esters for years. Well, yeah, in cetacaine and some of the other topical preparations, you have been using them. But this is the first time where we're using a tetracaine derivative, a tetracaine product, and we're using it intranasally to deliver an anesthesia to the anterior maxillary teeth, 4 to 13. And in that case, this tetracaine is crossing tissues. It does have a tendency now to get into the bloodstream. And if this patient has a PABA allergy, the use of Covenase would be contraindicated. So again, a simple question on the medical questionnaire, like do you have an allergy to sunscreen, PABA-based sunscreen, can make a world of difference here in treating this patient. Let's talk about analgesics. So what if we have a patient with, as I call, NSAID trust issues, meaning they've said that 
using NSAIDs in the past just haven't worked for them. And, and so they're reluctant to use NSAIDs only. They would like a prescription for opioids. Well, it's been my experience, and along with that with my dental colleagues, that perhaps a lot of times patients have failed on NSAIDs because they haven't used sufficient doses. Most patients will stick with the package, which says anywhere from 200 to 400 milligrams of ibuprofen. But that dose of ibuprofen is subtherapeutic. The treatment of dental pain requires an aggressive reduction in inflammation, which therefore aggressively reduces pain. So we can use doses up to 3,200 milligrams of ibuprofen in one day. Now again, if you're watching this, you're saying, wow, that's a lot of ibuprofen. Why would I want to go that high? Again, pain is a subjective experience. The quicker we reduce pain, the quicker we get people into the mindset of, hey, pain's no longer a barrier for me. I know when I go to the dentist, my pain's going to be treated effectively and aggressively, so I'm not going to be hesitant to visit my dentist again. Well, what if you've got a patient who says, no, I've done ibuprofen and I've done naproxen and it really doesn't work for me? Well, maybe it's time to consider some alternate agents, the agents that I call the ACs, you know, the Atotalax and the Diclofenax. They're in a different chemical class than ibuprofen and naproxen, but at the same time, they deliver that superior pain relief we're looking for. As opposed between ibuprofen and naproxen, you might say, well, what's the difference? Why can't I use naproxen? Why do you seem to be so uh, pro-ibuprofen? It's the same reason why I prefer Atotalac and Diclofenac over some of the other NSAIDs. It has to do with dosing frequency. Patients experience frequently breakthrough pain because dental pain is mostly inflammation. So we want to choose an agent that has that dosing flexibility of every four to six hours so that we can use another dose in the middle of our dosing regimen, essentially squeeze an extra dose in to combat that breakthrough pain. The one thing we can't do with NSAIDs is combine NSAIDs. So if you're taking uh, loading, for example, and again, it's every four hours and you feel pain at every two hours, you can't squeeze in an ibuprofen dose. So using NSAIDs together is not advantageous at all. We need to stick to our dosing regimen and use NSAIDs as aggressively as we can. What about patients who say they have an opioid allergy? You've heard this before. Patients say, I have an allergy to codeine, uh, mostly because of either nausea, uh, constipation, and I'm sure you've seen that on TV, right? OIC, opioid-induced constipation, uh, as in uh, OIC, I can't go. Uh, flushing, pruritus, you know, itchiness. Well, as long as it's a non-documented allergy, meaning that the allergy did not involve some type of generalized rash or airway involvement, we're going to say that it's probably what we call a pseudo-allergy, meaning that allergy is not a true allergy. True allergy, as a matter of fact, to opioids is rare. Well, in that case, we might consider a higher potency opioid, like oxycodone, over hydrocodone because oxycodone would provide less of that histamine release that causes the itching and the pruritus. Uh, and so we are using a better agent, although some people might consider them equally analgesic. Actually, oxycodone is about tw twice as uh, efficacious as hydrocodone. Uh, one thing we do know, uh, no Ultram, okay? Tramadol is contraindicated in the patients with true opioid allergy. What about those patients with opioid experience, if you know what I mean? Those patients that are seeking opioids and uh, looking to use them for recreational use. Well, again, uh, sharing is caring, yes? And so maybe you do want to be that uh, oral surgeon in this great state of uh, Pennsylvania and the great city of Philadelphia, as you can see at the top, who decides to write for 120 Percocet 10 325. You want to be able to make sure that patient is covered with Percocet for the rest of their lives. Well, maybe at least sharing with somebody else. And of course, you want to be able to prescribe it one every six to nine hours for chronic pain. And uh, yeah, spelling 20, T-W-E-N-T-E-Y, and chronic, C-R-O-N-I-C-K, I'm starting to doubt your uh, clinical skills already. So what about that patient for uh, using opioids anal as recreational drugs? Well, we're going to say we can achieve superior analgesia without using opioids. We can consider the concomitant administration of ibuprofen 600 milligrams and Tylenol, APAP, is 650 milligrams four times a day. However, in my opinion, I think we should maybe go with 800 milligrams of ibuprofen and 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol. Now, studies haven't shown that that's any better a combination, except in one place, here. 
And so that makes, for example, ibuprofen that's bought over the counter less effective than ibuprofen prescribed by you. Just getting the prescription yields a ton of that placebo effect that we're looking for. What about medications used in the systemic disease? How about cardiovascular disease? So the patient with hypertension, who's taking a calcium channel blocker like Norvasc or Procardia. Well, what do we know about that as far as dental implications? Well, we've learned recently that calcium channel blockers may decrease the osseointegration of dental implants. Well, that's interesting. We haven't seen this, the mechanism yet, but we can say that, for example, beta blockers have actually shown the opposite effect. So maybe it's time for a consult call to see if we can change therapies or at least be on the lookout for uh, more frequent uh, ch changes in the implant and maybe p potentially implant failure. What about the patient with thromboembolic disease? Well, the patient's taking an antiplatelet agent or an anticoagulant agent, things like Plavix and Pradoxa, and my all-time favorite drug of all, Cerveza, because how can you not love Cerveza? Exactly. So, what about implications of these drugs? Well, again, we know that the literature is behind us on this, that abrupt discontinuation for dental procedures puts the patient at unnecessary risk. Now, I know you're thinking about, what about a sinus lift? What about a full mouth extraction? What about a really involved procedure that could be bloody? I get it, but I think we should all remember to do what? Always take a partner. If you're going to make a unilateral decision to discontinue this therapy on your own, then so be it, you're going to face all of the liability as well. So take a partner and have a conversation. Remember though, don't wait too long and don't have that conversation afterwards because conversations like these are not what we're looking for and make us all look like we're not doing our jobs or treating the patient effectively. So what about uh, patients with thromboembolic disease that take an aspirin 81 milligrams once a day and also require ibuprofen for dental pain control? Well, we've learned that taking an ibuprofen dose along with that aspirin once a day can actually make that aspirin dose less effective. It can interfere with the cardioprotective effects of aspirin. So what have we learned? Always take the aspirin first. Wait two hours, take the dose of ibuprofen, and you can eliminate that drug interaction altogether. This is what we've learned as dental professionals over the course of time. Let's talk about gastrointestinal disease. The patient who takes a proton pump inhibitor because they have GERD. Well, you might say, I already know everything about GERD, Tom. I know about how acid interacts and interferes with the with, uh, medications and how acid can destroy tooth enamel. But what have we learned? We've said proton pump inhibitors now can interfere also with the osseointegration of dental implants. So maybe again, it's time for a change in therapy, a consult with their gastroenterologist to switch to something like an H2 antagonist like Pepsid. Well, what about the patient taking that tagamet, that cimetidine that's been around forever? One thing we've learned about cimetidine over the course of time is it's an enzyme inhibitor. It, it increases the effects of local anesthetics, opioids and sedatives, as well as illicit drugs. So you might actually see a patient taking a lot of tagamet to boost the effects of their heroin. Central nervous system disorders like bipolar disorder, well, lithium has come back strong lately as a natural treatment for bipolar disorder because it's a naturally occurring element. Well, we've learned that concomitant administration of NSAIDs with lithium can cause lithium toxicity. So we're looking for this pseudoparalysis, this muscle stiffness that occurs as a result of taking these two drugs together. How about schizophrenia? Patient taking Seroquel, quetiapine. Well, Seroquel is one of the few drugs that we've identified as a true QT interval prolonging agent, which means that concomitant use with epinephrine in local anesthesia can actually increase the risk of dysrhythmia. And finally, we'll finish up today with the uh, illicit use of licit drugs, folks. The patients that you have that are abusing levothyroxine, Synthroid, for rapid weight loss. You might say, well, why would anybody do that? Because it's a quick fix? Well, it's truly not real to believe you're going to take enough Synthroid to lose weight and excessive doses of Synthroid can lead to an exaggerated response to epinephrine and local anesthetic cartridges. What about the patient using Neurontin, Gabapentin, recreationally? You might say, well, isn't Gabapentin used for epilepsy and used for fibromyalgia? But Gabapentin is now the most widely abused prescription drug because in high doses, it delivers opioid-like effects. And lastly, what about the patient using a hallucinogen substitute like Imodium, AD, an over-the-counter agent for diarrhea. Well, why would you want to use Imodium recreationally? Wouldn't you feel bad for that patient? Obviously, they'd be in a, a bit of trouble using Imodium 
in high doses and be real constipated for the course of who knows, maybe days. But again, the issue with Imodium is in high doses, loperamide, Imodium is widely abused because it has hallucinogenic effects that are similar to other hallucinogens like LSD. Well, again, this is Tom Viola. It's been my privilege to provide this practice inspiration for you today. Thank you so much.